Welcome to the We Are Human Leaders podcast. I'm Alexis Sana, and together with my co-host Sally Clark, today we're taking a very raw and candid deep dive in this interview with Dr. Tani Bridson around mental health and the power of peer support in the workplace. Dr. Bridson has a story that, for many other healthcare professionals, will likely hit very close to home. It's one of struggle hidden mental illness and the challenges that come from caring for others in a very high stress and high stakes environment. In this conversation, Tani shares her very real personal experiences with mental illness and her journey to be part of the change in fighting the growing mental health crisis our healthcare providers face here in Australia. Tani is the founder of Hand in Hand Peer Support a visionary solution in combating the mental health crisis and surrounding stigma in healthcare by connecting medical professionals in Australia and New Zealand with free and confidential peer support. It was through this inspiring work that she was named Forbes 30 Under 30 in 2021 and Queensland's Young Australian of the Year in 2022. Tani is a psychiatry registrar at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and studied medicine at James Cook University in North Queensland, where she graduated with first class honours and was awarded the Rural Doctors Association of Queensland Prize. Tani is not only an incredible mind, but she's an incredible heart. Her leadership style is so deeply human and so innately connected to her purpose in advocating for mental health support and reducing the stigma. As a content warning, sensitive topics such as suicide, mental illness, eating disorders and other personal struggles are discussed, which may be triggering and distressing for some listeners. This episode is in no way psychological advice and should not be substituted for mental health advice. If you or someone you know is suffering with mental illness, please don't do so in silence. Reach out for help. In Australia, you can access 24-7 counselling through Lifeline, and wherever you are in the world, know that support is available. Please take care of yourself and know that you matter. So welcome to the We Are Human Leaders podcast, Tani. We're so delighted to have you with us today. And we'd really love to start this conversation just by getting to know you a little bit more. So can you start by sharing a little bit more for us about your story and, you know, the journey that's brought you to this incredible work that you're doing now? Yeah, I actually grew up in a small country town called Mariba, which is like in far, far north Queensland, um, inland from Cairns. Um, And I came from a family that yeah, I had never actually, you know, none of my parents or my, my grandparents had or aunties and uncles had gone to university or, you know, my parents actually hadn't finished school. So my dad grew up on a like cattle station in kind of the middle of the bush in Queensland. And my mum was um, an immigrant. So she was born in Sicily um, and her and her parents came over when she was a child to um, Australia and she started her life in Australia, not speaking kind of a word of English. Um, So they kind of came from two very different backgrounds, but also similar backgrounds in that, yeah, they, um, neither of them had the opportunity to really finish school. Um, My dad had to help out with his family and my mum came from a, a culture where I think it was sort of seen that if you were female then you know, your job was to marry and look after kids and, you know, you couldn't really finish school or like go to university. So she wasn't allowed to do any of that stuff and, and finish school and kind of got married (laughs) really early. Um, And, you know, though, I think knowing that both of my parents had aspirations and, you know, would have wanted to do other things with their life had they had the opportunity was kind of um, a big driver for me and that they always sort of, got me to make sure that I tried my best and really encouraged me to take opportunities and to, you know, make sure that if I I wanted to do something, I gave it my best shot. Um, So they were always, you know, super supportive and um, which was really helpful because I think growing up in a small town, everyone knows you and um, 
everyone knows who your family is and I guess at times it was difficult because again people kind of saw me as the the girl who you know was probably not like meant to do well or not you know meant to go to university and be a doctor um unfortunately there's just those sort of prejudices around even at school I was you know not really thought of as somebody who was going to be the brightest or you know do well and often sort of told oh well the boys are going to do better or the doctor's kid is going to do better than her and it's just kind of luck that she's <laughs> that she's doing this and you know I remember once my mum came in a uniform from Coles so she worked at Coles when I was growing up and the teacher kind of had a go at her and was like well you don't want to end up like your mum do you and you know said that in front of my mum um so I think it was difficult growing up because I I always felt like I was some sort of imposter even if I was doing well or you know things were going good it was like well it's never going to last everyone's telling me that you know I'm not meant to be here I'm not I'm not meant to be the girl that's doing this this is this is all going to end soon um and I think sometimes that's good but sometimes it's also really hard to be told that all the time and I really hate that you know there was that small-minded attitude and I'm sure it, w- it wouldn't be any different if I was in the city who knows it could have been worse I mean um but yeah it's, I just think it's really sad that you know you live in the country and you go to a public school and you know you don't have parents who are working corporate jobs or medical jobs or whatever and you're suddenly pigeonholed into this space of you know, you're the kid who's not going to do much with your life or be able to do much with your life um and that always really frustrated me and I think in a way also motivated me because when people would tell me that I wasn't going to be able to do something as much as it made me super anxious and you know a part of me like fully believed them I also just thought well what the hell like if I'm not going to do it I may as well try why should I give up um I've got nothing to lose um which I guess has served me well because I guess I've brought that attitude along with me but it's also really difficult because then you come into a career like medicine where you're it shouldn't matter but I feel like a lot of the time it does matter who you're related to or what school you went to or what university you went to and you are sort of constantly like fighting these prejudices of you know well no my my parents aren't doctors I didn't go to the top school in the country and yes I'm still working here and I'm still in Melbourne and I'm you know I'm doing this stuff it doesn't mean that I'm any less qualified or any less able than the other people who are here working with me um and I think it it sort of hit a well it hit a came at a crossroads or whatever you want to call it when I was in med school and um you know had some supervisors or some consultants that I worked with who were really um quite harsh and would always you know there's that kind of I don't know if you've seen scrubs but there's there's like Dr Cox who's like the supervisor of the junior doctors and is basically always telling them that they're crap you know that they're really bad and it's so true because there's so many like bosses that are like that in medicine and you know I had you know this period I guess where I I had that and um I guess it just you know I kept fighting like I kept trying to do my best but my best was just never good enough um it was just never enough and you know it got to the point where I got sick from like trying so hard to be perfect all the time and you know having no control over my life and um ended up you know really unwell in an emergency department with like you know all these doctors standing around me saying well you've got an eating disorder you've got anorexia nervosa and we're going to admit you whether you like it or not and you know and that was kind of the a bit of a turning point for me when you know I I kept thinking that I could push myself um to keep going and um yeah it kind of all just came <laughs> crashing down in a heap what's so striking about your story tani is that i think it illustrates this misconception that 
if you're a highly intelligent person, if you're a high achiever, that you're sort of immune to the impacts of mental health. And, you know, we obviously can see that there's this space between understanding mental health and actually the integration of it. And, you know, interestingly, in the medical field where I'm sure you're all very aware of the impacts of mental health, it can still be really challenging to take care of yourself. And, you know, certainly through your story, that seems to have been the case. But, you know, is this something that you see being really widespread in the healthcare industry? Yeah, there's like you know, there's higher rates of mental illness, especially at the moment with COVID and all the stresses and pressures that have been put on doctors and nurses and healthcare workers in general. I mean, there's been studies that have come out showing the high rates of burnout and, you know, symptoms of depression, symptoms of anxiety, thoughts of suicide in, you know, all types of healthcare workers. Um, But I think there's this really old school attitude in medicine that, you know, we have to wear our burnout as a badge of honor. And I guess this is the message that I've been really trying to spread the last few years is that that attitude is like prehistoric, that the way that we treat and, you know, it's not just medicine, but I guess I'm in medicine. So that's where I see it the most. And I I think like our profession is one of the worst, you know, we see this attitude where the boss is the God and, you know, you have to sacrifice everything for your bosses or your hospital and you're not, you know, it is changing. There are, you know, consultants and that who aren't like that anymore, but unfortunately there's still a lot of specialties and there's still a lot of leaders in healthcare who just don't see the human and they think that you don't deserve to be a doctor. You don't deserve to be on a training program or you don't deserve to be, have a job unless you are willing to like come to work half dead, you know? they they joke about how like in the old days you would never take a sick day um unless you were like in the ed on a drip (laughs) and you know people joke about that's how it used to be but it's not far off being like that still we've made so little progression in this profession that's supposed to be a caring profession but to our own colleagues we treat them so badly um and we don't want to hear about it. We don't want to talk about it or people are scared to talk about it. You know, even when I talk about the fact that, you know, I've had personal experiences of bullying or, you know, whatever you want to, you know, whatever it is, there's still this like fear in me. And it's the fact that I feel it and I kind of got some sort of platform where I should feel free or feel like, you know, I'm able to advocate for it and able to talk about it. The fact that I still feel scared that I'm going to get in trouble or that someone's going to like, you know, I don't know, try whatever they're going to try and do, ruin my career, whatever, because I'm trying to talk out about something that happened to me and make it more acceptable to get help and to talk about it and to actually, you know, report people or, you know, tell your, tell other people that you're being bullied. The fact that we feel so scared about it and, you know, that we can't do that because it's going to impact our career or we're not, you know, we're going to not have a job or we're not going to get the job that we want. It's just, it just seems so out of keeping with the modern world <laughs> and like how far we've progressed in other things. It's interesting, Tani, as a burnout researcher, what you're saying really resonates for me that even in this situation where it's really obvious that it's incredibly damaging, not only to, you know, as at an individual level, but also to the profession and to the capacity to uh, do your job correctly, that burnout has such a detrimental impact on us and other Um, mental health challenges as well that sort of schism between you know we're aware that that's the case but we're not actually making the changes and not seeing that shift um, from the profession itself and from those the bodies like the hospitals um, that it's having to be led by individuals uh, like yourself to start to see that change and it's a real it's a really courageous position to take I think when you know that there are very real um, potential impacts on on your career as a result I'm, I'm curious was that the moment that you mentioned in the ER, was that was that a kind of a turning point for you? Or I'm curious sort of how the journey evolved for you after that point. I think this is the other thing that I probably haven't spoken so much about, um, but I guess it's something that I think is important to highlight, is that having an illness or a mental illness, it's not always like you see in the movies, like you have that turning point and suddenly everything's better. Um, I think it's a journey and sometimes it's something that you struggle with hopefully not for life but it can be something that people struggle with for years and it takes takes time and I think when I first had that experience I 
was like very anti-psychiatry, uh, was like very science focused, had never had any contact with mental health, was like, this is not, you know, this is wrong. <laughs> I don't have this illness. And I think they often say like in the eating disorder space that you eat your way out. And I just kind of ate my way out <laughs> and, and then kind of tried to like run away <laughs> from having to deal with, I think, the issues or the things that had contributed to that. And I also had, I felt like I wasn't very well supported by my colleagues. You know, I was in a small hospital where I was obviously at uni and so everyone knew each other. And as much as it's supposed to be private, it wasn't private. Like, you know, my confidentiality was broken. Um, and, you know, people don't do it on purpose, but it, it just was. And I think then I also had people sort of saying to me that because I had this, I wasn't going to be able to finish. Like I wasn't going to be able to pass the exams. I'd missed too much. Like, you know, just all these really negative like things that people were sort of saying to me and really made me feel like I was just not going to be able to do it. And I think I just put all of my energy into, I just wanted to give it a go. And I wanted to prove these people who were telling me this, like that they were wrong. Um, and so I put all my focus, I think that year into just like studying and my exams. And, um, you know, I always went into exams feeling like I was going to fail, but it was the first time in my life where I've I'd actually like, I'd kind of just accepted it because so many people had just said to me, there was no way I was going to be able to be a doctor with like a mental illness. And, you know, this was like the end kind of thing, but I was determined to give it a go. And I ended up like, you know, doing well in the exams. And I'm not saying that's what everyone has to do in that setting and, you know, finishing and graduating from med school. But it wasn't really until I finished med school because I'd ignored it for so long that it kind of came back to bite me. <laughs> you know in the butt because I just I'd tried to ignore it I didn't want to think about it I didn't want to accept that I had this um I mean in other ways I'd made steps towards like you know this was a really good experience and I wanted to learn from it and I had in that time I got to come down to Melbourne and do an elective in mental health um with Origin down here which was so eye-opening and it was such a a different experience than I'd had as a patient. I was about the same age, you know, it was a few years ago. So they do 12 to 25. And it was just such a different experience, the way the patients were treated and just like, you know, the way they were included in their care and the way that they spoke to their patients. And at seeing that and then seeing some amazing psychiatrists there and all the research that they were doing, which I'd been really involved in, and you know, sort of when I got sick, told that I wasn't going to be able to do research anymore which was sort of heartbreaking to me. But then I got to go down and do this elective and I got back involved in research. And I really sort of like saw that there was so many things like not, you know, available for mental health. And there were so many treatments not available that I then sort of really got interested in it. And I went down that path of like doing mental health. And I think in a way, maybe that was because of my own stuff as well. You know, like I wanted to sort of figure out what was going on for me as well. Um, but I still hadn't really like addressed my own stuff and so it did it, it came back to bite me a few times um and and it's still like it's still something that's like not you know easy to you know I guess you people do are cured or you know are recovered sometimes but it's still something that's like really difficult for for me anyway and for a lot of people I think um but I think I've just got better at like accepting help from others and, you know, not feeling this need that I have to be invincible and I have to do it all on my own. Um, I think a good turning point for me was actually the Australian of the Year um, award where they spoke to me, um, you know, about did I, what was my personal story? And, you know, they talked to me about how it would be really, it was up to me, but it could be really helpful and could be really empowering to other people to actually, you know, tell my story for the first time um and so I actually think in a way it you know it was really scary and it you know there was all this worry that it would be a bad thing and it would you know, I'd get you know I don't know <laughs> it would go really badly but um I think it was a bit of a turning point in terms of accepting my own story a little bit more um and being a bit 
nicer to myself as well and realizing that being human like having flaws is not a bad thing like it's good to have flaws and you know I think sometimes I always had this idea that you know you couldn't fail you had to be like always strive to to do your best to sort of be perfect not that anything is perfect or anyone's perfect but realizing that actually being imperfect you know you can be you can do more good (laughs) than by always looking like everything's you know perfect I love that Tani and I think sometimes when we when we're vulnerable and honest about what we've been through what we're going through we give others the opportunity to love us as we truly are rather than the veneer that we're presenting and that um, that takes enormous courage but it can also be very um, beautiful to have that experience of people seeing our true story and loving it not loving it not in despite of it but because of that whole person that we are so that's such an inspiring um, inspiring inspiring story thank you so much for sharing I'm curious you mentioned that the the aspect of um, sharing what's going on and talking to others as being part of uh, how you support yourself now. And I know with Hand to Hand, it being a peer support network for, for healthcare professionals, how do you think peer support specifically helps us address mental health in a way that's different from perhaps more traditional uh, mental health support? Yeah, so I guess with our peer support model, we um, like to think that it's more of like a preventive um, you know, it's the it's the preclinical before clinical intervention is needed stage, um, and there's kind of this like public health analogy where most of what we do in healthcare is like someone falling off the cliff and the ambulance is at the bottom catching them, and the idea with peer support and getting to people early is that actually we put up fences and stop them even getting to the cliff. You know, it's not going to work all the time. It's not going to work for everyone. There's going to be there's, you know, always going to be people who maybe potentially need more intensive support. But, you know, there's, I, I think for me personally, the idea kind of came from my own experience in that I was like so isolated and sometimes it can be really isolating having an illness and it, I had no one to talk to, you know, I was like stuck in this hospital by myself, kind of told that I was the only person going through this. And, you know, I, it was like, made to feel terrible because I was going through it and I just always think that if I had had somebody going through something similar at that time you know another doctor or another healthcare worker to talk to and listen to their own experiences like it would have I just always feel like it would have helped me so much to know that I wasn't alone (laughs) so this this is kind of the like you know the evidence I guess behind the peer support model you know, which has obviously been going on for years in other industries. But then there's also, I guess, my personal view and why I felt it would be helpful. And and we see it too. I mean, peer support is what they use in things like Alcoholics Anonymous or um, even the most like, you know, obvious example is like your mother baby groups. They're, um, you know, peer support groups for new mums. And um, they're often, you know, really helpful. One of our members often likes to joke that his wife is still in a mum's and baby's group 31 years (laughs) down the line. (laughs) Gold. (laughs) I think this really highlights the power of human connection through peer support in helping us deal with a myriad of issues, as you've mentioned, Tani, from Alcohols Anonymous through to new mothers and new parents groups. And I think that we forget that all jobs are still a deeply human experience. And I think that for healthcare workers, you know, we we often see the white coat or we see the doctor first and we forget that there's actually a human being beneath that having to use their brain and leave their kids at home every day to show up and, um save lives and take care of people. And I think that it's almost like this compartmentalization of when you walk in the doors of the hospital, like now you're the doctor, you're you're not the human anymore. And I I imagine that would be really challenging. And, you know, I, I would love to dive into this further because I think, you know, we have the metrics now to understand the impact of mental health across industry, but can you maybe highlight for us, like what's the impact of poor mental health in the healthcare industry you know and how does it actually impact on some of these doctors ability and and nurses and physios and other healthcare workers how does that actually impact on their ability to do their job I mean I think the most 
you know, simple example is just sort of, you know, days of work lost. I think, you know, we, there's probably a lot, I don't know off the top of my head, but, you know, what's the, the metric days off for, you know, work days lost or whatever it might be, the official name is, but, um, you know, the number of days that people are off sick and then the, you know, additional burden on the other staff, not that it's bad to take time off, you know, people need to take time off. But I think when we leave things that late that people are, are so unwell, then the, you know, we also lose staffing and we, you know, increase the, the burden on the system as a whole, um, you know, the, the bed pressures, all of that kind of stuff, it all like piles into one another. And, um, you know, whereas if we're able to support people and, you know, it just comes back to simple things too, like even just making sure staff get a lunch break so that, you know, it doesn't contribute to their burnout or like having a bathroom break, stuff like that. If we could, you know, just make the, sure these simple like human rights are granted to, to healthcare workers, the like level of burnout and, you know, not even going as far as mental illness, but just like, you know, sort of compassion fatigue, all of that sort of stuff would just, if we could actually treat our staff right, you know, that would improve astronomically. And it's just stuff that's been going on like for years. And, you know, there's just been so little movement in these ba providing these basic necessities to staff. Yeah. And I can see how frustrated you are even just, you know, describing that being on the receiving end of that. And, you know, it's interesting because you mentioned these ideas of, you know, absenteeism, people having to have sick days. Um, and we know that, you know, absenteeism or, or um, long periods of being in burnout is obviously in a lot of ways a precursor to employee retention issues. And in a country like Australia, where we already have such a healthcare worker shortage, and we have, as you said, increasing bed pressures, it's an entire systemic issue at that point. And I think, you know, that that's in the worst case scenario, but I think before that we even have the impacts to patient care. I imagine someone who's got um, such a mental load and such a heavy burden of dealing with mental illness, isn't able to deliver the best possible clinical care that they could, should they be on their game and, and feel like they're able to take care of themselves. Yeah, well, I was just going to say absenteeism is kind of the later stage. But yeah, we also have like presenteeism where people are there, but like not functioning at their best. And, you know, that's not good for them. It's not good for the patient care. It's not good for anyone. But there's just this, you know, pressure, I think, that health systems put on people to keep turning up, to keep turning up. We just you know, there's, there's so much pressure and that's why there is this thing, presenteeism, where we all end up turning up to work even when we shouldn't be there. And that just, again, like leads to burnout. <laughs> yeah, so much of what you're saying really echoes a lot of the research that I've done into burnout as well in the sense that it's, these are systemic issues. It's, we shouldn't be, when it comes down to people having lunch breaks and uh, being, you know, having healthy working hours, being able to rest and recuperate in a way that our bodies and minds need to properly function. These are systemic issues. This should not be down to one individual making a case-by-case -case decision for themselves or for others. We really need to redress things at a systemic level, level in organisations so that people aren't having to try and set these boundaries for themselves, but, the, the, but that the systems are actually working to ensure that people have well-being and and balance in life that we need to to be our best selves and I'm um, I'm curious you mentioned earlier that there's there's this real stigma um, around mental health issues in the medical world I'd love to dig in a little bit to why you think that's that stigma remains I think it's really complex but I think some of it goes back to the kind of medicine in many ways like yes we have all these like modern technologies but it's also kind of archaic in the the way that we interact with each other and this hierarchical approach where, you know, you wouldn't dare call someone who's a professor anything but their, you know, title, even though you might be called like intern, you know. <laughs> you know, there's this real kind of, it's very like old age, isn't it? You, you shouldn't be seeing that in the workplaces, but yet that still exists in medicine. And I think a lot of those older attitudes where you had to turn up, you had to be there every day, you couldn't be sick, 
that all sort of plays into then the stigma that, well, you can't be unwell and you can't have a mental illness. And, you know, there's still so much stigma in the general population about mental health and getting help that you would think our own profession would be better at dealing with that. But in fact, you know, we're probably most of the time worse. And unfortunately, within medicine and within specialties, people sometimes look down on psychiatry. They look down on us and, you know, think that we're not as worthy as specialists or a specialty. Um, And so, you know, why would we, and then of course that then feeds more into the stigma and not wanting to get help and that kind of stuff. And I think it's only like with our generation and the younger, you know, generation coming through that we're really trying to fight this um, old school attitude because I think it's just, I feel that it's just leading to more issues and more, you know, more lives lost, more careers lost, more burnout, more illness. It's not helping anyone. (laughs) It sounds both fascinating that medicine, as you mentioned, can have some of this incredible leading technology and be at the fore of so many innovative ways in fixing human problems, yet, as you mentioned as well, be almost behind the ball when it comes to addressing mental health and you've made note that it's a combination of things from a systemic sort of industry-wide issue around hierarchy and the nature of the work but there's also this stigma that you need to be the highest performing people in your field and therefore shouldn't be incurring or having mental health issues, which is, you know, hugely problematic. And I'd love to dive into how peer support maybe provides an alternative to some of the more traditional counseling or psychology and the sorts of things that we would traditionally access as a way to handle mental health. What are your thoughts? Like, how does peer support do this differently? And, you know, is it more preventative? Does it ease people into mental health support? I'd love to know more about how peer support sort of fits um, differently with the medical profession and might provide us a new way of looking at addressing mental health. Yeah, I think peer support, because it is seen as sort of, you know, the step before clinical help, I think we've noticed that a lot of people feel so much more comfortable coming to us, you know, and it's almost like, they, they feel like asking for some peer support is more acceptable than going to their doctor and getting help. Um, and which is great. We're, you know, I guess that's why we want to be here because we want people to reach out to help. Um, and, you know, we want people to feel like it's okay to do that. Um, and, and even like when people do come to us and, you know, we sort of say, we think that, you know, you'd also benefit from some additional support, maybe a psychologist or something like that. It it feels like people are almost more open to it when we say it because, you know, it's like we're confirming that, you know, it's okay to get help. It's, you know, we're reassuring them. Um, So I think the the peer support concept can have lots and lots of of benefits in terms of people actually accessing help and reducing stigma, things like that. And I think in answer to the second part of your question, you know, we're always going to need the next, you know, the various stages of, of treatment for people because, you know, but I guess we would like to see, well, for the time being where we're in healthcare, of course, if we could, you know, provide peer support to everyone, be great. (laughs) If we were able to expand, I think what we would like to see is people getting that help earlier because obviously the later things get left, the harder it is then to find treatment. You know, there's all this pressure on, psychologists, psychiatrists, GPs, and, um, you know, the later you leave it, the harder it is to get treatment and harder it is to also get the treatment that you might want. Because, you know, if somebody's really unwell, the decision kind of gets taken out of their hands sometimes, not always, but unfortunately sometimes it does. Um, and so, you know, we are really trying to advocate for people to, to come and seek support earlier on. And I think also, from a junior doctor perspective, I think so often we feel like we don't have control of our lives and the reality is we don't, like we work so much and, you know, we sometimes like hospitals or whatever are, you know, not really supportive of holidays or taking a day off, that kind of stuff. And, you know, my colleagues and I, we'd love to see that change, but this was kind of 
the change that we could make or the thing that we could offer at that point in time and that we can still offer. You know, there's things that we can change, there's things that we can't change. This was one thing that we thought we could provide to the healthcare profession. We not, might not be able to change the way like hospital systems work or managers work or admin work or whatever, but we can at least sort of put some sort of scaffolding there to support people. And, you know, hopefully from the fact that we've been able to like get more support of, peer, of our peer support program and we've been able to get more, you know, people aware of us, Hopefully, you know, our work and our advocacy as well can also help to lead some of the health systems and the hospitals to be recognising the importance of making these changes. And, you know, not being, you know, I had a friend who was at a hospital in another state and said in the middle of COVID that, um, you know, the, the management put some fruit out on the table in the clinical areas for them to eat as their, like, show of support. And this is people who are in full PPE all day, you know, not allowed to eat in the hospital. <laughs> like, and so sometimes there's just like a complete disconnect between what the people up here think is helpful and what the people like on the ground doing the work <laughs> would feel is actually helpful. It's, it's not even a Band-Aid. No, it's not even a Band-Aid. It's like, okay, maybe I'll take the fruit home and, you know, I'll take the COVID-covered fruit home. <laughs> To be honest, I'm a little baffled by this at this point to think that we can treat healthcare professionals in that way during probably the most burdened experience of their careers just really shows the disconnect, as you've said, Tani, from management understanding what it is that you actually need to perform your roles. And, you know, I'll go further to say that this isn't an isolated thing necessarily to the healthcare industry. We've seen, you know, a lot of organizations wanting to intentionally address thing address things like mental health and well being, but not, you know, they'll introduce things like gym memberships or um, I don't know, staff parties and all these kinds of things to help try and address employees' well being and mental health. But systemically there's no change to things like the working conditions, on call rates the expectation or the job design while they're at work. You know, you've mentioned that on an eight or a 12 hour shift or whatever it is you're doing, there's no time for toilet breaks. There's no time for lunch breaks. Like that's systemically an issue of overloading staff. And it speaks to this, as you've said, you're doing your best to address this in the way that you can, which is introduce peer support, which is really, um, a preventative way of handling mental health. However, it's not addressing the big picture and that is what are the working conditions for healthcare professionals? And if leadership and those running hospitals don't step up and actually look at things like the job design and the pressures on healthcare professionals and shift that fundamentally in a systemic way, there's only so much that getting support for your mental health can do when you're experiencing overload and um, stress on a day-to-day basis that's actually not able to be reduced through the way that you work? I think just basic stuff would, would be, you know, working hours, like working the actual hours that you're rostered to work and actually having like a designated lunch break. I mean, there are not many, I don't feel like there are too many professions left out there where it's seen as like a crime to take a lunch break um, or, you know, stop for a break. So I think simple stuff like that, just allowing people to have the break and work their actual designated hours. Or if, you know, obviously we know there are emergencies and we know that not everything in health is smooth sailing and that sometimes there will be situations that we just can't leave. You know, that's it's always going to be the unpredictable in health. But how about like actually getting paid for that over time? And not having to, you know, fight to get paid or not being able to get paid or having to justify why you're getting paid only to be told it's not a sufficient reason that you shouldn't have had to stay back to do that. You know, I mean, simple things like that just shouldn't even have to be so difficult. Um, And then, of course, you know, being able to take leave. Like why I, I obviously get, again, that we are a stretched health system, but why is it that as, you know, juniors we only get a certain amount of leave each year or you know that we can't take unpaid leave or you know like things like that we just wouldn't even 
think of doing really. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just feel like it's so basic, <laughs> like, you know, really common sense kind of things that need to change. And I think sometimes like people who have been around for a while, you know, who are in leadership positions can sometimes kind of look down on people like me and other people in my generation and say that we're all just kind of sooks and, you know, we don't know how good we have it. And, you know, we just whinge about everything and, you know, we're the generation that just complains all the time. But I think it's not that. I think it's just that now, you know, we, I guess, are a generation that have been taught what's right and what's not right. And, you know, that's sort of been instilled in us. And we're not happy to just kind of sit around and and be treated like this. And, you know, I think the pressures at the moment are probably the worst they've been since, like, the Spanish flu or the wars. So to say that, well, we had it worse, you we can't say that. You can't compare apples with oranges. You know, like, people can judge and criticise or whatever all they want, but I think they at some level need to take on board the feedback of the people who are working on the ground who are saying how difficult it is and look at the stats of, you know, how overwhelmed the hospitals are at the moment. You know, you're not going to pluck staff out of thin air unless things change. They're going to go where the best conditions are. And I know for me, I, you know, I'm, I'm so lucky at the moment because I work in a job that's super supportive and, you know, my, I love the position that I've got and, everyone is you know really supportive and and I obviously like had in the past been at places where I wasn't that supported and I left you know like that and and that's what's going to happen people aren't going to stick around for it I have to say as a Gen Xer I'm just so excited for that change and that for me it's not it's not being sooks or being weak it's actually powerful to say this is not okay and we're not going to accept these kind of working conditions and that might have been okay for the older generations but and you're right that apples and oranges comparison doesn't get us anywhere and is just only keeps us stuck in 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 the past so I, I'm really excited for that I think very empowering steps that that your generation is 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 taking towards creating the shift that we so so urgently need um Tani, I'm really curious just to sort of um, wrap up a conversation. I'm wondering if someone's listening and they're really in a position where they are struggling with their mental health and, and your story is really resonating for them, what advice uh, would you give them? I think don't wait until, you know, somebody is making a call for you. Like I'm all about like empowerment and having a having some control and autonomy over your life and treatment and um, as hard as it is, I think reach out to someone and it doesn't have to be a doctor um, or a health professional. It can be a friend, someone that you trust, a parent, whoever it might be. But I think, you know, it can be so, I think the right word is cathartic to just like talk with someone about what's going on. Sometimes that whole like word vomit, <laughs> just <laughs> debriefing with someone, you might not know how helpful that that act of just talking to someone can be. And, and I think don't discount that, the power of talking. Tani, thank you. That has been such a powerful and such a potent message. What I've got from that is to not allow yourself to sit in silence and feel alone if you are struggling with mental health issues, to reach out, to speak up, to connect because there are other people going through what you're going through. And as you've highlighted today, Tani, in particular in the healthcare industry, thank you so much for being with us today, Tani, for sharing such a candid and raw personal experience. We appreciate you and we appreciate the incredible work that you're doing so much. Thank you for being with us on We Are Human Leaders. Thank you so much for having me. If this episode has raised issues for you, please know that there is no shame in reaching out for help. In Australia, you can access 24-7 counselling through Lifeline. And wherever you are in the world, support is available. Please take care of yourself and know that you matter. This episode is not in any way psychological advice and should not be substituted for mental health advice. 
To learn more about Dr. Tani Bridson and connect with the Hand in Hand support platform, please see our show notes for full details. We hope this episode has brought to the fore the power of peer support in life and business and the power of community in helping break the stigma and address mental health in a preventative way. If you'd like to feel connected and supported in your leadership journey, we invite you to join us at www.wearehumanleaders.com. Thank you for being with us for this episode.